to uh, receive your feedback on things, but I, I, I have collaborated with the SIS. And the work I'm going to tell you about um, was really uh, inspired and led by Harvard Murrigan um, and largely carried out in the lab and data analysis and uh, computation by Konstantin Evans, uh, who really deserves the bulk of the credit for this, and I'm just the spokesman. But what I'd like to talk about today is how genetics of nucleation in molecular self-assembly uh, can perform pattern recognition, a kind of uh, computation. And what we're really interested in, the reason we sort of got to this question, is we're interested in how simple molecular systems can make complex decisions. I'm going to start with a uh, prototypical type of pattern recognition that's uh, relevant to us, which is smell. So if you're going to smell something, there's either in the air or if you're a fish in the water, uh, a collection of molecules with different concentrations of each type. And you need to identify what those molecules mean when some are high and some are low. Different blends of molecules can be represented in a different way. We might just list out the different chemical compounds that are present, uh, you know, from one to a thousand or whatever it is, uh, and say, what's their concentration? And that's a pattern. Some of those patterns will be relevant to us. Some of them won't. Um, for this talk, because we're uh, humans who are visual creatures, uh, patterns will also be represented uh, as a 2D image. That's just listing out the different chemical compounds in chosen order and um, representing their concentration as a grayscale. Um, and I'll choose patterns that are meaningful to us humans, but really there's nothing about this that's uh, image-related or 2D-related. It's just going to be vectors of how much stuff is there of this particular chemical. So smell then, or pattern recognition or classification of smells, some kind of decision function that takes, if we have n different species, takes n real numbers and then decides uh, what kind of smell is this? What does it tell us? Are we smelling a rose or wine or a specific very variety of cheese or a horse or various other things that might be relevant to us? Okay, so this is the kind of pattern recognition that we're going to be um, challenging taking as a challenge to ask, how can a molecular system do it? Do we need something as complex as a human brain and the nose? Uh, well, bacteria also interact with varieties of chemicals and uh, need to decide what kind of environment they're in and where they should go and what they should do. So presumably something smaller can do the job. And what we're ultimately going to lead to is that non-living, very simple molecular systems uh, do pattern recognition, at least to some degree, um, without any kind of living components. So I'm going to sort of uh, tell the story a little bit backwards. I'm going to tell you sort of what we did and then get around to how we did it. The claim is that if we have uh, designed DNA odorant signals, uh, they can discriminate patterns via nucleation kinetics. And odorant signal, I mean uh, something whose presence is determined by some odorant. So uh, you might imagine some kind of system where if there's an odorant, it triggers the release of a particular DNA molecule or pops open a DNA molecule. Um, something like this activates it. So that the concentration of that particular molecule represents the concentration of your relevant odorant. We're just going to take it from there, not worry about the encoding. Um, we're going to have 917 species. They're going to be single-stranded molecules of DNA, about 42 nucleotides each, very short, sort of, you know, you know what that molecule is, designed it also. Uh, we'll take those and in some blend, different concentrations of each molecule, put them into a test tube, and then over a long time, um, many hours, uh, we'll cool that test tube down, as the test tube cools, the molecules will come together, self-assemble into shapes, um, and uh, 
In this case, the shapes will be H's, A's, and M's. And whether you get A's, H's, or M's is the classification of the odorant. Which type is it? H, type A, type M. Okay. So we're going to, sort of at the end of the day, show you that um, one can take a set of images. Here's the actual images that we used in our experiments. There are 18 of them. Here's some uh, map from pixel location, which corresponds to, say, an odorant species, to which DNA molecule gets produced by that odorant. Uh, and so a particular image will correspond to a particular pattern of concentrations of the DNA molecules. Based on those concentrations, the self-assembly process will nucleate in different ways, form a different structure. Um, okay, so this is a particular DNA system that we designed, but ultimately what we're trying to explore is not what kinds of contraptions can you build with DNA, but rather we're trying to explore a particular instance of a general phenomenon uh, that could be governing protein self-assembly or other kinds of molecular self-assembly in a general sense. Um, we just need something concrete to get our hands on. And what does it say that we, got, we made a system that did, did this? Well, you might imagine that there's a phase diagram for these molecules that depending upon the concentrations, only two concentration dimensions are, are shown here, but you can imagine it's a very high dimensional space. And there are these boundaries between whether the shape you make is an A, the shape you make is an H, the shape you make is an M. If the system really sort of makes just one of these three types of shapes, uh, then space of all possible concentration vectors is divided up into these three groups and maybe some other groups where none of our intended things happened. Okay, so this gives a perspective that uh, a phase diagram is really um, a decision boundary. It's representing a computation. If you have a phase diagram of a very simple system with maybe two or three components, that's maybe not a very interesting phase diagram. It's just you know the phase diagram for water, ice, and and uh, vapor, for example. Um, but what's different here is that this is a multi-component system, and there's a sense in which this phase diagram uh, boundaries are programmable. And this is the connection to machine learning that uh, by designing our molecules, we can put our uh, boundaries in different places so as to accommodate a particular uh, set of images that we want to classify in a particular way. Okay, as we'll see, this is not a thermodynamic phase diagram. This is a kinetic one, so maybe I'm abusing the terminology, um, but this is sort of what happens on experimental timescales. So I'm now gonna tell you how we did it. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the technological foundation um, work uh, primarily led by uh, Peng Yin, uh, both as a graduate student postdoc and later in his own lab. Uh, the molecules we have are uh, um, as I said, these short single-stranded pieces of DNA. The key thing about DNA is I'm not showing any DNA sequences, but often you don't need to think about the sequences. If you have an orange Region, this might have a particular sequence. Um, I can synthesize the DNA molecule with whatever sequence I want, so I can choose that. And it's Watson Crick complementary to another single stranded molecule, a T where there's an A, a C where there's a G, uh, then those molecules can bind together. So, for example, if this, give the inconsistent color code, is the same as this molecule here with four different regions that have just been given names. A4 star is complementary to A4, so these two molecules will stick to each other. So simply by writing out a diagram for how my DNA molecules are supposed to stick in a very non-linear way, it forms, in fact, a tube, um, I can sort of specify just the fact that I need to design sequences where A4 is distinct from B4 is distinct from A5, etc., finding sequences that satisfy those criterion, I can design a system that self-assembles into a particular structure. In this case, uh, because the left and right ends are 
uh, identical, it makes a long periodic tube. OK. Um, you can make things other than tubes. Uh, something uh, quite remarkable is that you can design finite structures here um, where there are about 300 molecules. Each one is distinct. There's no repeats. So every molecule in this assembly is a specific one, you know, UA4.3 is the name of one of these molecules that has very specific, uh, essentially, barcode interactions with four neighbors. If you get a system like this that can, where every molecule can find its partner, uh, specifically during the self-assembly process, uh, then you have a, a, a very powerful system that can be programmed in a variety of ways. Uh, the simplest way of programming it is to just leave out some of the molecules shown in gray here. So the same set of molecules, but with some left out, you could call that a low concentration, uh, you get a different structure. OK, so what we did using this basic technology is uh, design the molecules in a way that they have to make a decision while they're assembling. So um, the story I'm going to tell is inspired by um, Arvin's fire work. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to skip over the details there because I don't have time. But I'm just acknowledging that what I'm saying at the theoretical level was published by Arvin years ago. Our innovation was to do it in practice. Um, here's what we did. So here are three shapes. Each of these shapes is analogous to the previous work I showed you, where every molecule, a molecule is, is represented as a square here, every molecule is unique in this shape. It doesn't appear twice. And every molecule is unique in this shape. It doesn't appear twice within the same shape, similarly for the third one. However, there are certain molecules, the purple ones, uh, for example, S149, which appears in these three locations, these purple ones are shared among all three shapes. So if one shape grows and uses up the purple tiles, the other ones can't grow. So that's decision process being made. OK. Um, we'll get more to the arrangement of the purple tiles and, and, and the color tiles. So we call them shape-specific tiles um, and shared tiles. So is... Uh given a unique set of uh, these molecules, is the conformation they get into unique? The molecules, of course, can do a lot of things. So the question is, what's the probabilities? Yeah. Um, if you look sort of thermodynamically, actually many very low energy states that involve these things coming together in horrible ways, the Designs here were made such that locally there's a certain kind of proofreading and self-healing capability, such that there aren't very many possible nearby matches. And this has uh, uh, sort of encourages the growth process to uh, be very robust. And I'll show you experimental results that these are overwhelmingly the dominant shapes. But that's a kinetic result rather than a thermodynamic result. There's a secret sauce. That's the secret sauce, yes. OK, what do the molecules actually look like? Um, we can draw them as squares. We can draw them as sort of straight lines. We can draw them respecting the double helix. But essentially, each molecule is given a name. It has a number for the barcode of DNA sequence that it binds to. And if you have an assembly of these molecules, at a, which is, for example, this shape here is what putting a bunch of things like this together would look like for these molecules. And in the solution are many molecules with many different sequences. And what we need is the one that binds to specifically these two, matching the sticky ends that are at these two locations. OK, and in this case, this one matches uh, this one does not match on 
side, which you could see because it has a 708, whereas this one does match the 708. So this is experimental results. If you mix all of those 917 molecules together, and look at it on an atomic force microscope, you get a mixture of all three shapes, roughly uh, equal mixture. Uh, some of them don't grow all the way, but you have good H's, partially grown H's, good A's, partially grown A's, et cetera. So how does a system like this make decisions? If Rather than having an equal concentration of all the species, you have some pattern of concentrations. And this pattern of, say, odorants corresponds to releases a particular pattern of the tiles. And we can now ask for each tile in the system, what concentration is it? Is it a low concentration or a high concentration? Okay, if we had the apples and they release this pattern of concentrations, same shared tiles are in all three shapes. And here we get a high concentration localized region, but we don't get high concentration localized regions in the other shape. Okay, so that's due to the cleverness of our design. Didn't tell you that secret sauce. But the trick to our design is that for uh, a shape that should be classified as A, because it's an apple, get co-localization in A, or a shape that should be classified as M because it's a magnolia, you get co-localization in M, and similarly the horse co-localizes uh, in H. So what that gives rise to is a process as we're cooling it down, where nucleation is easiest to occur in these places where there's a lot of high concentration tiles, and you grow those structures first. What's shown here is a, uh, a fluorescence measurement. We have fluorophores on specific tiles so that when H starts to grow, the red fluorophore gets quenched, and we see that um, H grew even before we take the sample off and do atomic force microscopy. And here's the A and there's the M. OK. So that's the basic uh, example of sort of how the arrangement of tiles essentially embodies a decision to like or dislike different concentration patterns of the DNA strains. OK. Um, so can we understand that a little bit more? Um, these maps are maps of predicted nucleation rates according to a model. I want to tell you a little bit about our model. Um, it's basically a kinetic model where molecules can bump into each other at some constant rate. They fall off according to how well they bind, um, how many interactions they have with their neighbors. And for this model, we can assign uh, an energy, give an assembly with a specific tiles in particular places based on the number of correct bonds that they form where the Watson-Crick whispers match. And then there's an entropic term uh, based on the concentrations of the tiles that are involved. And that entropic term is essentially the one that will uh, uh, lower the energy barrier for assemblies that uh, have high concentration tiles. That allows us to uh, look at the free energy of simulated trajectories. So here's a trajectory starting with just one tile, two tiles, three tiles, four tiles, etc of, um, there's a number of different trajectories here, of building uh, parts of, in this case, uh, the H shape. So this is for a concentration pattern that has a co-localized region of high concentration tiles in H, but where the high concentration tiles are scattered in the other shapes. If you look at possible assembly pathways for A and M, there's only uh, high energy pathways involved. So the, this is just a formalization of the basic intuition. That localizing high concentration tiles leads to a, uh, a decrease in the energy barrier. Um, okay, so if we, if we look at this more carefully, we can see a few things, for example, that 
uh, in all of these shapes, regardless of the concentration uh, pattern, the H shape, um, in every case, is the lowest, from a dynamically lowest energy fully uh, formed shape. So our results aren't thermodynamic results. They're kinetic results. They're due to the nucleation barrier rather than the thermodynamics. We never get to equilibrium. So that's nice. Um, we can ask, you know, is this a completely anomalous sort of weird way that um, molecules form one of three objects and we're just calling it a pattern recognition? I, th I think it's a little deeper than that. Um, there's actually mathematical parallels to uh, neural network models. Um, neural network models are often represented with a quadratic energy function with programmable weights. And we know how to tune those weights, for example, by Hebbian learning to uh, develop a neural network that has energy minima in the places we need. What we're doing here, this is our free energy of an assembly with uh, a term that determines whether species I and species J bind to each other when in two neighboring positions and whether those uh, species are the assembly or not. Um, we also get this sort of quadratic looking energy function. It also defines uh, the energy landscape. However, in our case, it's the concentration dependence of the energy barriers that's making the selection of which basin you end up in. There is a difference in, in these models in that in the Hopfield network these weights are assumed to be sort of arbitrary. All to all connections are possible. As in the self-assembly system, any given molecule only has a limited number of neighbors um, that sort of correspond to different possible uh, grids, or different shapes that the system might have. It turns out that this isn't a new restriction on the Hopfield model. It's uh, been encountered in studies in neuroscience uh, of the ice cell system for how uh, animals can recognize which environment they're in and where they, they are in an environment. It's kind of sort of restricted multiple map uh, situation comes up uh, there as well. Okay, so I get to wrap up with some philosophy. Um, so mechanical tigers and hidden tigers. So in the DNA nanotechnology world, we engineer molecular systems that do neat things. There's some concept, that's the tiger. Maybe it's an algorithm. It's a way of doing some kind of decision process. And we've got the tiger in mind, and then we use our skills with designing molecules, DNA, or what have you, and we build something in the shape of the tiger that performs that purpose. That's sort of engineering. What Arvin taught me is that it can be very interesting to look for hidden tigers. Systems in the natural world that have that tiger in them, if only you could see it. And it's good to be able to see them because they might be lurking all over the place. Phenomena you don't know about. So Arvind was able to see that this sort of neural network computation was inherent in this kind of self-assembly process, uh, which is... Uh, ubiquitous kind of process. Uh, nucleation happens all over the place. If we look at uh, the cell, the biological cell, there's uh, multi-component enzyme assemblies that form or don't form based on nucleation kinetics. There's molecular machines that must nucleate. There are uh, uh, multi-component phase-separated liquid condensates that also have many interactions and an energy function. What, what do the phase diagrams for these kinds of systems look like? How complex are their decision boundaries? How can we program those decision boundaries by changing the coupling of interactions between systems? And do we essentially have neural network-like computation going on in all of these kinds of processes inside the cell? If so, that's the hidden tiger. That's our audience for questions. So, um, so it seems like uh, you have some type of game 
uh, that you, you start something and you say it's nuclear, which means it goes into something bigger. And uh, so there are many, uh, I think you pointed out in one of your last slides, there are many things in nature uh, that uh, have mutation uh, in, in life and living organisms. So is this a complicated way of, of uh, just getting game? Like it's a sensor. Uh, sensors, usually you need game at some point. Yes, that, that that is where where the gain comes from. Sort of the there's a more subtle uh, sort of energy process during the nucleation stage, and then it gets locked into place. In fact, we call it a winner take all phenomenon, where by depleting the the shared tiles, the process wins. Um, I think the more interesting thing than that sort of lock in phenomenon here is the high dimensionality. That is to say, the patterns that are being discriminated uh, share many, many pixels. And it's by integrating information about multiple pixels and making a decision based on that, that you can classify th these patterns in, in, in the way that we wanted to. Um, and I, I think that's the thing that, at least to me, sort of comes as a surprise that when you look at very low dimensional nucleation phenomena, it doesn't look like neural networks. When you look at high dimensional nucleation phenomena, suddenly it starts looking like neural networks. Training parameter in this setting, and how do we update it? How to find the correct? Um... That's a longer talk. <laughs> um, one of the interesting things in this work is that it was actually somewhat analogous to reservoir computing, in that we designed the, the shapes H, A, and M, and once that worked, we asked, "Well, is there any possibility that we could get pattern recognition out of it?" And so if I go to this, uh, where is it? Yeah, here. Um, this map of which pixel or odorant corresponds to which tile in the system, that was determined actually after we built the molecules by essentially uh, a, a different map of which pixel corresponds to which tile gives rise to different localizations of the, in the existing shapes. And so we can find a map that localizes the key species in each of these images by a brute force hill climbing process. That's how we actually did it. Um, there are sort of one layer of learning. There's other possibility uh, sort of layers of learning that, that Arvind is particularly interested in, where you don't know what shapes you have, but provide input in terms of, uh, let's stick these pieces together, then you learn which ones that have interactions with each other. And so I think that there's sort of a, a deep area there to be explored beyond the somewhat ad hoc thing that we did in this work. There will do last question, and the rest will go to the break. So is the end goal to be able to do things like smell classification in the chemical domain? Is that the idea? My interest in this is uh, how do we build molecular machines like cells? So I want to understand sort of uh, uh, complex information-based chemistry by building complex information-based chemistry. So part of that is figuring out how much information processing can fit in a very small volume, like a micron or less. And, and so what's exciting about this is that the computation, this sort of neural network-like computation, is intrinsic just in the interactions of the molecules without any extra sort of uh, devices, enzymes, molecular components that we need to build. Just the molecules themselves stick to each other in the right ways so as to nucleate when you need them to. And that's particularly compact. Yeah, okay, then I have a follow-up question. So, I mean, this data maps uh, your images to chemical concentration. So can I just plot the concentration of that HIM visual diagram and then look at them and figure out whether I'm going to get an HIM or an M? Like, do I need to run self-assembly? You don't need to, but you're big. <laughs> but I mean, so the question is, if, if I were trying to build a molecular-scale robot, I want to build an artificial cell, and I want to put something inside that cell, it makes it make the right choices at the right time. How do I do that? I need to build some molecular system inside a cell that does information processing. Your input, is it coming from like the analog domain or are you taking digital? The, the input would be coming from, from chemical sensors on, on the environment of the cell. 
working in the chemical domain. Okay, so then my initial question holds, which is, um, do you need a chemical adapter then? Convert from like a, uh, like your actual chemical input to then a pattern? A absolutely, absolutely. So, so this is this is the inside part. Um, no, no. Also long, but 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 uh, a short answer is one possible place to investigate is there um, actually evolved molecules called DNA aptamers that stick to small things like let's say caffeine, and because of their sequence and various chemistry stuff, uh, you know they adopt a certain conformation when they stick. And that can be used to modify sort of the conformation of other DNA molecules, activate or deactivate these kinds of tiles. In principle, that would be a research project to make it work. So it's like your DA kind of, it's like chemical. Yeah. 